what decentralized exchange or what a decentralized concept, exchange right we're gonna have concept. a conversation about this this is go a lot of different ways okay um I hope we have enough time. If not, it'll be two shows. We're not going to get into. No, the no, no, no. We have plenty of time. Don't worry. Oh, okay. We, cool. we, we, we. This is our network. Well, we'll just bump off a little. John bit. told me it goes to nine o'clock. But well, we bump a little Batista's back. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you know what I wanted to do with uh, the show here on Thursdays is stay away from how a lot of this stuff works, the technical specifics, and again talk about some larger concepts. And this one, you know, as I said, I get excited to come on on Thursdays because I try to come up with topics that I think you guys are going to find mm -hmm. interesting. And this is one that you know not a lot of people know about this or really understand what this is. But once you start to just figure out the basics, it's pretty mind-blowing. Um, and there's a lot of potential implications here that we'll talk about as well. But it's this concept of decentralized exchange. And if we could just jump to the first slide, I'll kind of break that down. Um, what we're talking about is transformational in that this is an exchange that runs on a blockchain without any intermediary. There's no middleman. There's no broker, even. It's just code. Now, there are the same roles in a sense, but again, they're played by you know, code base, really. And to trade in a decentralized exchange, and this gets into this concept of self-sovereignty, self-custody, and ownership, all you have to do is connect the wallet where you hold your digital assets, and then you trade through liquidity pools, we'll, which we'll explain here in a little bit. So it's permissionless. Um, you're not constantly connected. When you want to transact, whether that's every day, it's once a month, whenever it is, you go and you connect, and then you transact, uh, you know, pending liquidity yeah. being available. And so that central limit order book does not exist, and instead is replaced by an algorithm that most decentralized exchanges use, called an automated market maker. And anyone can provide liquidity as well, which is pretty cool about this. And I'll just stop there if you have want to take. Oh, it I'm anywhere. I'm already I'm already all you're ahead over of this. Me. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not ahead of you. I'm just I'm all over this concept. He's what you call an overperformer. Well, no, no, no. I'm all over the concept because I am a, a, a strong believer in that this is where we're going. Okay. And I don't mean just. I mean, much. I think that listed exchanges in the next uh, generation of listed exchanges are going to look more like decentralized exchanges, not like the current listed exchanges. Yeah, completely agree. People might think this show is scripted because I come in here. You are ahead of me. I thought I had this axe to grind. I can just present no, no, these no ideas to no Tom. Axe. No, no, no. I'm saying like I mean, I mean, we're, my we're, angle. Yeah, we're we're. You know, like like with the small exchange that we just acquired, reacquired, you know, we're thinking about it, even though it's a listed exchange, as a decent, like with decentralized logic. That's good to know. We have to, yeah. because that's what the future is going to look like. Cool. Well, I'm even more excited now because uh, yeah. you're already agreeing with me. So let's jump to the next slide and just look at kind of a better visualization, maybe, of what okay. we're talking about here. So we've got Trader Ryan up here. That's back when I had the stash. Um, that's nice. Yeah, it's a pretty good one, right? So I have Ethereum, and I want to sell it for dollars. Let's just walk through kind of what this looks yeah. like, right? Yeah. We talked about a liquidity pool. I've connected my wallet here. And what you're actually doing is you're adding Ethereum tokens to the pool. You're removing, um, calling it USD or US dollar here, but you're removing a US dollar stable coin, or you're removing any other token, right? These right, doesn't matter. Yeah. For cryptos could be tokens right. that represent assets, whatever it might be. But you're transacting through this code base and you're transacting through this pool. And so when that happens, right, I'm adding Ethereum to the pool. So there's more Ethereum, supply goes up, US dollar supply goes down. And what we're going to see as a result, as this rebalances, and it rebalances based on a formula, and the pricing mechanism runs off of what's called a, a constant product formula, we're not going to get into that today. But what ultimately happens is that the Ethereum price um, should decrease, given that there's more supply uh, through this mechanism. But there's no broker. There's no market maker in the traditional sense. There's no custodian. There's no real counterparty here. Uh, you're just going and you're participating in an open source, uh, to some extent, internet protocol. And that's what's really kind of fascinating about this because it's the implications, not today, not replacing the financial system or anything crazy like that, but just how the system most likely evolves over time to leverage this technology and how this technology 
grows. So that's what it kind of looks like if it's easier to see. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's great. And the protocol charges a fee, which is important to point out as we talk about uh, providing liquidity in just a second. So in the same way that we might charge a commission as a pro as a brokerage, um, the protocol charges a fee on the notional value of the transaction. So if we could jump to the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit more about providing liquidity. This is what I think everyone's going to find is fascinating because this is just a way to make money. Um, I've been doing this for a while, and when I first again found out about it, it was like, oh wow. I can participate on the other side of this. And so what you end up doing is you're staking capital in the pool, you're staking tokens, and then you're just receiving a portion of the fees that are accrued by the exchange as trading happens. You're kind of your own broker, to think about it differently. You're running your own brokerage on the blockchain, and it runs 24-7. So it's a function of you know, trading activity. There's definitely going to be times when there's more activity compared to others, but that's how you make money. But here. you're really more of your own, you're, you're your own market maker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. I kind of equate like receiving the fees to being the brokerage yourself. Okay, it's fine. But yeah, you are, you are providing liquidity, you yeah. are facilitating the market making process. And as a function of that, right, you're short fall. We want a ton of trading activity, but we don't want very large swings in the price because that's where, as that liquidity provider, you experience some risk. Yeah. Um, I won't get into impermanent loss. Just think of that right now as kind of the difference between if I held the asset and it made a big, let's say, upside move for one side of the pair moved uh, very quickly compared to the other. You know, in theory, I could lose money um, compared to just holding those assets. Um, your downside here is if one of these cryptocurrencies goes to zero. So if we use the Ethereum USD pair, your downside risk is Ethereum. If Ethereum goes to zero, you've lost all of your money. Um, but that's kind of how it would work, regardless of what markets you're making. If we saw the price of one completely drop, you know, very very quickly. Okay. So this fee goes to anyone that's providing liquidity, and that's what I think is really interesting. Again, about this is that you can come to this exchange permissionless, and you can decide to really deposit tokens um, and provide liquidity and receive those fees. So if we go to the next slide, you can see kind of just again how that might. Look. How much are those fees on a percentage of? What do those fees average? Yeah, so I'll jump into that at the end. Can we we can actually look at the thirty okay. day average on Uniswap? Okay, sure. But um, anecdotally, you know, again, it depends on how much trading activity. But I have run pools where you're making half a percent per day on your underlying capital. I know that sounds insane. Um, I've been in for just providing liquidity. For, yes, exactly. Yep, and that's on a daily basis. So you annualize that. You know, it starts to grow pretty large. You can compound that as well. So the fees that you generate as you're providing liquidity, you can see up here, you're receiving fees in both tokens. So you receive fees in Ethereum, which for a lot of people, you know, I'd love that because I'm bullish Ethereum. You also receive fees in USDC. Now, will you be able to do this if you want to add some capital to the liquidity pool? Will you be able to do this through the Tasty Wallet? You'll be able to use the Tasty Wallet to connect to some of these, and ultimately, we want to bring some of that internally. Um, but the answer, the short answer is yes. Eventually. Yes, yeah. Got That's it. one of the reasons why I want to present some of these concepts, because yeah. this is a real use case. You know that market's going to tighten, though. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's oh. going to go down from notional to fee-based. Yes, but right now... Um, yeah, that's not going to be around that long. It is. Well... It's been two years. Um, I, I I've know, seen periods where it's you know much more efficient. I think, to your point, no one knows about this. Right. Well, it's just it's too. There's too. There's going to be the regular, the regulatory. When the regulatory pressure comes off and the money flows in, it the fees will get squashed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You will see them come down, but I I think they still will provide that incentive. Uh, to anyone that wants to participate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, no, they'll definitely be percent. But it, be. as a small fish, I'm not going to make the money that I'm making today providing liquidity in, you know, let's say, six months or a year if this continues to grow at the rate Got which it. it is. But um, 
Yeah, you can compound this as well. You can you know, go in there and take your fees and just put them back in on a regular basis if you want to. It's important to understand you pay to interact with the network, and most of what we're talking about here is on Ethereum, so you're gonna pay a gas fee. Sometimes it can be very expensive. So there is a cost to participating in that sense, but once it's up and running, um, as you're managing it, you know there's no there's no real cost beyond that your, other than your risk that Those exists. Those gas fees are still a thing of the uh, future now. They're sticking around. They are right now. You know, I think what you're going to see, what you are seeing, is you know efforts to bring that down. Um, the continued evolution of the Ethereum blockchain or the network. You have other layer twos that are much cheaper to transact on. So over time, those fees are going to come down. But yeah, Tony, it's still really, really high. I mean, I've done this for a couple of years. There have been points in time where I've been able to create one of these structures and participate for, let's say, thirty dollars. And there have been points in time. Uh, I think a year ago. Six hundred dollars. Yeah, they, they, and they fluctuate intraday too, right? Like yes. time of day. Yeah. Really well, good. it's a function of just activity on the network, and certainly you're going to see more activity uh, at various points in time. Yeah, that circles right back to the liquidity issue again. As soon as you get more eyes on everywhere, everything comes lower. Yeah, yeah, that's another great point where you would see that evolve as well. Would it be, be if we would it? Would this be an incentive for us to build our own blockchain? Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. We're talking about things that have only been in existence for a few years. The biggest one, and we can kind of jump around because the slides go in a few different directions here, but the biggest protocol today or decentralized exchange is Uniswap. Yeah. Um, and that's been around for four or five years or so now. You know, it's at a version where it's a lot easier, a lot better to yeah. use. and. You know, it's still going to. to I go. haven't done anything on Uniswap yet, but it's my. As soon as we can through our own wallets, I will. Awesome. Well, let's take a look at the next slide, and you can just see what this looks like. Um, if you haven't connected to one of these, you haven't used one of these. If you've never seen a Dex, um, this is this is what the interface looks like. So on one side, we've got the swap component. So you connected your wallet. You go in here. I've got a couple of Ethereum. I want to trade it for one token or another. You select it from the drop down. Get all your details. I mean, it's very similar to you know, putting an order in through any other platform. And then you swap. Um, on the other side of that, you can provide liquidity. And so this is what that interface looks like. So you can't see it that well up on the screen. But this is a liquidity pool that's got $13,000 in it. And it's generated $92 in fees. That's your $13,000. Yeah, this is just, just a pool that I have. Right. Um, but that $92 on the $13,000, you know, I rebalanced this pool Saturday morning. And I took this screenshot yesterday. So it's not a huge amount of money, but I looked at it this morning and after the volatility yesterday, um, that pool is now a little bit over 200 from um, you know another from a day. So you can have these points in time where you see a ton of trading activity and you're generating a ton of fees, just like any other brokerage would but make this money. Is, this is the Uniswap site. This is Uniswap, yes. Yeah, yep. yeah. this is the interface. Um, there are other decentralized exchanges. Uniswap's <laughs> the biggest. I would say it's the best, um, in my opinion, my personal opinion. And when you look at the revenue that it's generated, it's one of the only or first DeFi protocols to generate over a billion dollars in fees or in revenue um, on a yearly basis. So it's really one of the biggest. It's one of the real kind of true use cases um, when you look at what's happening in DeFi here today. Uh, this is real. And so that's what it looks like. Um, if we jump to the next slide, I just got a couple of data points that maybe you guys will find interesting as we wrap this up. But these decentralized exchanges, Uniswap, others, they're deployed across multiple chains. But where you're seeing the majority of the activity is still on Ethereum. That's where the majority of total value locked is. You can think about that as the capital that's been deployed in a smart contract or deposited or staked uh, is probably a better term to provide liquidity. So across the Ethereum blockchain, um, you can see the trading volume on decentralized exchanges. You can see the value locked. You have the Binance chain, Arbitrum, uh, and a couple others up there. But really, it's it's Ethereum that takes the, the share. If we jump to the next screen, you can also see that um, when we drill down into the Ethereum network and we look at Uniswap again, users are growing. That's the purple line that we have. Um, those are the weekly fees. So if I kind of squint at the screen here, you know, you're looking at 10 to $15 million that this is generating in fees that are going to the participants um, on a weekly basis. And you can see, you know, the usage is up quite a bit um, where we go from that 
big green bar in the middle of November 22, the FTX collapse, you know, you've got users that have almost doubled from there in terms of um, participants with the Uniswap decentralized exchange specifically. 60% of market share. Um, you know, and again, this is like relative to the, the real world. Um, these numbers are, are peanuts. But the point is that this is growing and growing. And you look at an S1 from Coinbase, you look at kind of others in this space. This is a threat to those business models, ultimately, the technology is not necessarily Uniswap, but yeah. the tech. Yeah. So all that said, let's just take a quick look at the rates and um, finish up. So you asked earlier, you know, what can you make? It really depends on where you're providing liquidity. So we have a few different pools up here that I'll walk through really quickly. Crypto versus crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, it's wrapped Bitcoin on the Ethereum network. Um, regardless, $260 million in total value locked, not a ton. And there's a, an APY right now on the 30-day 30, uh, 30 average that's running about 7% annualized. Get to the Ethereum USD pool, um, you do have a bit of volatility that you have to manage there at times. Much bigger pool, over $3 billion in TVL right now. And these are well, well off of the highs that we've seen at times, but running at a 23% rate. And then you have stable coins, which you know, there's definitely risk there. We've seen a bit of a, a short term. Yeah, like why would anybody do that for four tenths of a percent? It's a good question. I, you know, knowing the risks that we're aware of now, maybe you wouldn't. Um, but it is a very large pool, and there is. Yeah, but why would you even consider it? Yeah. Well, in the, I guess the the argument would be that you're not going to see another depeg of that stable coin. You know that these I know, are going to depeg. No, but risk free rates in the U.S. are four percent or five percent. You know, four and a half percent. Yeah. Why would you even consider that? Well, I think you would consider this if you're, I wouldn't say crypto only or crypto native, but this is just the crypto world, a lot harder than to get back to the other world. You might just be doing this temporarily as you move into other things. So um, what's the risk? Is that there's there's a decoupling, there's a principal risk? Oh, in this case, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, principal risk. I mean, the larger risk when we talk about this nascent technology is, hasn't been hacked yet, but you know, we see that quite often, and I'm not calling out any one exchange or anything. It's just like, yeah. you know, there's security risk for sure. Yeah. Um, and then when we look at Ethereum versus uh, staked Ethereum, uh, staked Ethereum derivative, you know, you can see that there's not much of a, a rate there either because these two things should be almost, you know, pegged to one another or stable, almost the same price in that sense. So those are some of the rates. I focus mostly on the Ethereum USD pool, but um, if we just click to the the final slide here. Again, I think it's the implications. That's where the conversation is really a lot more interesting. Um, not only the implications that it has on the financial system, but if you represent some form of value in a, a tokenized form, then you have the ability to automatically, or at least in theory, you have a facility for liquidity. I can exchange my airline miles or my um, reward points from Starbucks or whatever it might be. There might be a way to unlock value there. Um, it, it certainly, you know, has implications on the existing uh, kind of system of, of market makers and, and how we provide liquidity today. Yeah. But uh, that's what I wanted to bring to, to the table, explain to everybody, decentralized exchange. No, that's good.